Y'all have that one friend. You invite them somewhere, him or her. You know, it's a party, it's a bar, your little cousin's birthday party. I mean, he's definitely a friend of yours. Whatever the event, y'all have a great time. A-plus guy. Y'all make some memories. Things are good. In the back of your mind, you think about how good of a time that guy was, right? So the next time you go out, you give him a call. He pukes in the back of the Uber. Things are getting a little shifty here. Two weeks later, y'all make some plans. He calls you last minute and bails. So you're left with your brajol in your hand, and you're like, I thought we was friends. But a month later, it's his birthday. He calls you up. He wants the party. He buys a section at the club. Paid for, VIP, sparklers, bottles. He even brings the drugs. Let's go. Y'all are friends again. That guy that we all have in our life, I actually feel like every one of my friends is that guy. I don't know if I have anyone that's not that guy. Is equally the best and the worst at the same time. It's okay to have people like that in your life, but not to depend on when things get tough because you never know what to expect. And to project those type of people to be a core part of your success in life is not reasonable. It's, it, it, I would go as far as saying it's wildly irresponsible. And if y'all haven't figured it out yet, I'm geniusly segueing from talking about drugs in the club to fantasy football to relay the point of how important consistency is. Now that things here at the headquarters are in full swing creation mode, we're working hard on the draft guide. Y'all know that if you are already a purchaser, you have access to the consistency charts in the draft guide on bigdogdraftguide.com. The consistency charts are what we're going over today. Today specifically, we're going to talk about quarterbacks and tight ends. I know they're the boring positions, but I promise you there's a lot of value in today's episode, a lot of things that we can learn as an overall strategy because of the consistency, and then we'll go from there. Next week's will be running back and wide receiver because I need to dive in deep on that bitch in order to really get across my points with the skill positions. So on my consistency charts, there are five different sections. These sections encapsulate how many fantasy points a player scored in a given week. There's busty from zero to 13 points. There's extra medium from 13 to 17 points. There's cooking 17 to 23, booming 23 to 18. And then there's absolutely faded the public 28 plus points. This is for quarterbacks for tight ends, which we'll get to in a little bit. Zero to seven, seven to 12, 12 to 17, 17 to 24, 24 plus. Each game that a quarterback has, if they fall into a specific category, that means they had a game, you know, if they had 18 fantasy points, they were cooking. So we're going to look at guys who were all over the place, were consistent, and what we could take away from these overall season-long performances. And again, if y'all want to access the consistency charts right now, y'all can do that. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Go cop the guide. It's the, the cheapest that it's going to be all summer right now because it's pre-order. It don't launch till later, but some of the tools that we get up like the consistency chart, are available to you right now. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. So let's hit that sweet, 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 sweet big dog clap. All right, for the quarterbacks, all these points are for two-point interception penalty. Regular four-point per passing touchdown, two-point interception penalty. Some sites use minus one. The stats might be a little bit skewed, but I think you should put whatever the touchdown total is. My preferred scoring system is to have it as half the interception penalty. So if you're doing six point per passing touchdown, I like to do minus three point for interceptions. If you're doing four point per passing touchdown, I like to do minus two points. That's the scoring that we use for these consistency charts. It should come as no surprise that uh, Lamar Jackson was really fucking good in 2019. Guy had one busty game, zero extra medium games, nine games in which he faded the public. Nine games of over 28 fantasy points. And he only played in 15 games. He only played in 15 games, went over 28 fantasy points in 9 of 15, which is ridiculous. I'm sure everyone's going to go back and point to his touchdown rate this offseason. That's going to be the whole spiel, right? Where should we draft Lamar Jackson? He's so good. He was so good last year. Can we depend on him to do the same things that he did last year again? No, because his touchdown rate was 9%. If I had a dollar for every time a fantasy football analyst talked about his 9% touchdown rate and that it's going to regress, I'd be a rich motherfucker and I wouldn't even have to do podcasting anymore. But that's what we're going to hear. And it is an unreal number and it will come down. However, the guy ran for 1,200 plus yards as a goddamn quarterback. There were literally only five running backs in the entire NFL that had more rushing yards than him. If you literally just looked at his running numbers, his rushing stats, right, his yards and his touchdowns, he would literally be the RB21 and half PPR. And keep in mind, all those running backs are getting their receiving yardage totals on top of that, half PPR, right? If you take out all of his rushing stats, he is still the quarterback 14 in fantasy just off his passing stats. So it wasn't one or the other, it was both. The guy is a good NFL quarterback. He's the MVP. Say what you want about regression, but his style of play dictates that even during an inefficient season, the guy is gonna eat. So again, Lamar, one busty game, nine FTP games out of 15 games. Outside of Lamar, there were only six quarterbacks 
that busted in fewer than 20% of their games, which will segue me into my next guy. We have Matt Ryan, Patrick Mahomes, Ryan Tannehill, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, and again, let me repeat that. There were six quarterbacks in the NFL last year in fantasy football that busted in fewer than 20% of their games. So they were busting at a very, 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 very low rate. So they gave you a really nice floor. Patrick Mahomes, Matt Ryan, Ryan Tannehill, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, and Josh Allen. Joshua Allen, Buffalo Bills quarterback. I tweeted this out yesterday or two days ago. Make sure you follow me on the Twitter, Nick underscore B-D-G-E. He low-key might have been the most consistent fantasy quarterback not named Lamar Jackson. We're going to discount week 17 from Joshua Allen because he threw for five passing yards. Obviously, he didn't play the whole game. He busted in just two of those 15 games that he was the starting quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. Those two games in which he busted, New England and Baltimore. Those were brutal matchups. Outside of those, he was fantastic. In the other 13, he scored 16 fantasy points in every single one of those 13 games. Yes, a lot of people are going to be like, well, he didn't have the ceiling, so he never won you a game. But listen, we are a channel that always vocalizes our love for super flex leagues. Super flex leagues are the future. They are the now, but for a lot of the mainstream, they will be the future soon. With Josh Allen scoring 16 points in almost every single game, that is a beautiful, beautiful super flex option to have as your quarterback because you know what you're getting. You're getting a solid performance week in, week out. Yes, in one quarterback leagues, you want a guy that probably has a little bit more of a ceiling, but I mean, 16 fantasy points in nearly every game. So he cooked up in seven. He was booming in two, faded the public in one. So again, right, not that much of a ceiling when it comes to Josh Allen, especially you think of him as a more of a running quarterback. He quietly became a fantastic floor play this year. And I think it's a testament to what the Bills did in the offseason, right? They added new, a bunch of new offensive linemen. I think they they added like six new pieces on the offensive line this offseason. Signed John Brown, signed Cole Beasley, drafted Devin Singletary, drafted Dawson Knox. So they bought into Josh Allen and it clearly showed. And you could easily, easily, I'm not, uh, this is fantasy football people. You could easily still argue that Josh Allen is a miserable quarterback in terms of just pure passing efficiency numbers through the air. But listen, the guy's a fucking warrior. He gets the job done. He's a winner. He's a fucking competitor. And I want him on my team. Fantasy, real life, I don't care. Yo, this is, you couldn't find a better competitor to be the Bills Mafia quarterback. If he wasn't on the football field, I promise you he'd be slamming through tables in the parking lot of a Buffalo Bills game. It's a beautiful fit. This this year was a step in the right direction for Josh Allen, though, right? Like, I, I you could say, I, I'm not here to tell you that he was a miserable passer, because I, I think he's fine, he's, he's whatever. It was a step in the right direction, 100%. So here's the biggest improvement for me from a passing standpoint when it comes to fantasy. He averaged over a point and a half more fantasy points per game this year than he did in his rookie season, and that is despite averaging 21 fewer rushing yards per game in 2019. He took a step back in the rushing department in terms of yardage and efficiency, but he was better in fantasy. I know he scored a lot of rushing touchdowns, but that is always going to be a part of his game. When you're six foot four or whatever, and you're on the goal line, they're going to give you the ball a lot. His completion percentage overall, just raw completions, went up by 6%. His touchdown ratio was negative his rookie year, 10 12. This year, jumped up from 10 to 12 to 20 to 9. Touchdown interception ratio. So all the raw numbers tell you that Josh Allen took a huge step forward in terms of the passing efficiency. Like last year, it seemed like all of his games were like 28-point fantasy games backed by 90-plus yard rushing performances. Or if he didn't do that, he basically posted like 8 fantasy points a game. And again, this year was not the case whatsoever for Josh Allen. 16 fantasy points in all but two of the games that he played in, not counting Week 17. So at this point, I don't care how I feel about Josh Allen as a passer. I don't care how you feel about Josh Allen as a passer. If they add one more legit pass catcher this offseason, either through free agency or through the NFL draft, I would love if they took a wide receiver in one of the early rounds. Allen might be one of my most owned quarterbacks in fantasy football in 2020 super flex leagues. Josh Allen, let's fucking roll. We want to talk about the good. We have to flip the coin and talk about the bad. Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah. Super Bowl quarterback, right? <clears throat> Jimmy Garoppolo was fucking terrible this year in fantasy football some of you guys might remember some of the big games he had but oh my god 16 games he played finally got the full season he busted in 10 of those games 10 of 16 games and again bust means 0 to 13 points so he was scoring you 13 or fewer fantasy points in 10 of 16 games that does not count the three playoff games in which he had single digit fantasy points and yes you can attribute some of it to the fact that the offense was very run heavy they were the second most run heavy team in the NFL Baltimore was the only team that ran the ball 
on a higher percentage of their throws. Those numbers are via sharpfootballstats.com. But that's not an excuse considering the first guy we talked about in the good section of this was Lamar Jackson. And now we have Jimmy Garoppolo who ran the ball at a lower rate than the Baltimore Ravens did. And this guy could not get it done. So he busted in 10 games. So it's like, why would you get, why would you have any excitement about Jimmy G? Here's the reason why. People remember the the ends of the spectrums. He faded the public three separate times. So he had three games over 28 fantasy points. Only three quarterbacks in the NFL did so in more games than Jimmy G did last year. So for as bad as he was uh, in a lot of games, he also had very, very, very big games. And not a lot of quarterbacks can put that on their resume. Those three games in which he faded the public were the only three games the entire year where he threw for over 300 passing yards. Like this dude was really bad. Not usable in fantasy outside of four games. Two of those four games came against Arizona. So two of the four games in which he was good or usable was against Arizona. Another one was against Cincinnati. You have four good games, three of them against bottom five pass defenses. He had that one explosion game against New Orleans. And to be honest with you, I can't really tell you what the fuck happened. It was 48, 46. Everyone was throwing up fucking bombs, putting up stats, putting up numbers. Yay. Jimmy G such a good fantasy quarterback. Wrong point I'm getting across here is just, it's just not good. It's not good for my guy, Jimmy G. I mean, we'll see what happens with their off season. This is going to be an interest dichotomy to see what happens with their running back group. They'll get heard back, likely losing Emmanuel Sanders, but we'll see, you know, maybe if they use a higher pick in the draft on a wide receiver or weapon. I don't know. But key takeaway here is that Jimmy G was absolutely awful for fantasy last year. If you're in a super flex league, which you should be again, more often than not, you probably could have like flexed an actual skill player over Jimmy G. And if you're in a super flex league and that's the case, that probably tells you all you need to know. There are a couple other names that I want to throw out there, right? We're going to talk about the really good, the really bad. But Jimmy G was not the only really bad quarterback. The other three names I want to throw out here are Philip Rivers, Mitch Trubisky, and Aaron Rodgers. Rivers busted in half of his games, 8 of 16 games, without putting up a single game where he faded the public. He gave you his floor most of the time, the majority of the time, with zero ceiling. That is not good. He will be on a, a different team in the NFL in 2020, and he will also be on a different team than my fantasy team in 2020. I don't care if he lands on the fucking Colts. I don't care if he lands on wherever. He had a great supporting cast around him this year and still did absolutely nothing with it. Rivers' arm might as well not be on his body. Talking about guys that can't throw for shit. Trubisky was actually really, really fun to watch in the beginning of the year. I felt collectively as a fan group, like people who just watch the NFL or fantasy football fans, whenever Mitch Trubisky would drop back for a pass, I was excited. I was like, yo, this is going to be fun. Like we could all collectively enjoy this next ridiculous throw that he's going to make. Whether it was like four yards behind his receiver or six yards over his tight end. Every time Trubisky dropped back to throw the ball, you knew you were getting something entertaining at the least. It wasn't going to be a good throw, but it was going to be entertaining for us as a collective football group. It was so weird to me that they the, Trubisky just didn't run the ball over the beginning of the season too. And that was part of his game in 2018 that made him so successful as a fantasy football quarterback, or at least what made him have those big games a little bit of a floor. It's what made people buy into him in 2019. But at the end of the day, he busted in eight of 15 games. So over half of his games were bust games, one extra medium game, four games where he was cooking. So that's not terrible. One boom in game, one fade the public. So he really didn't give you a ceiling. He gave you the floor more than the majority of time. They didn't start running the ball until the second half of the year. As you could see here, the rushing numbers obviously escalated and he was much better as a fantasy quarterback. But from a passing standpoint, man, if if the rushing thing is not there, game in and game out, you can't rely on this guy. It's still ugly over there. Now, it was ugly for Aaron Rodgers too. And him being listed here as one of the bad consistent quarterbacks of 2019 is probably not a surprise to you especially if you owned him this year because you used a early pick on him and you were like Rodgers what the fuck is you doing Rodgers busted in 44 percent of his games he gave you three extra medium games between cook and boom and fade the public he had two of the other categories he had two of those but I think there's a bit of context to put behind Aaron Rodgers's dip and the numbers that we saw deflate in 2019, and I'm, I'm going to break them down for you, okay? I think it has a lot to do with what we talked about in last week's video, right? Every Thursday, I do one of these individual sensual videos where I talk to you. I break it down face-to-face, -face, so make sure you, if you missed last week's video, which was my top 10 lessons learned from the 2019 fantasy football season. We talked about coaching. I talked about the Green Bay Packers, just their style of offensive scheme, how much it switched this year, and we should have seen that coming. The offense was much more run-heavy this year, right? 
32.5% of their plays in 2018 were on the ground. That boosted up almost 8% to 40% in 2019. So they ran the ball on 40% of their plays this year, as opposed to just 32.5% the year prior. Rodgers' 569 pass attempts this year was a five-year low. And that comes with the fact that they had basically no legitimate pass-catching weapons on the outside, outside of Devontae Adams, who obviously missed a bunch of time this year. He's banged up with the ankle. And it just was a, a rough supporting cast for Aaron Rodgers to work with and throw the ball deep and, you know, just have any sort of efficiency. If you're going to have lower volume, you're going to need efficiency. And without a weapons group around you, very hard to do that. When you look at the raw numbers, like, yes, it's Aaron Rodgers and you're you're expecting elite, elite numbers from him, but he still had a 26 to four touchdown to interception ratio, seventh highest accuracy rating per player profiler.com, lower pass attempts overall. And the Packers threw to their running backs on 24% of their plays. Again, that goes to show you that the lack of outside weapons drew Aaron Rodgers to have a much lower average depth of target. He was dumping the ball off way more. Obviously, we saw that with Aaron Jones, had a big year through the air. Had he had other weapons on the outside, had Devontae Adams maybe not miss, you know, four or five games or whatever he missed, legitimate field stretchers, not named Marquez valdez Scanling and Jordan Miles, maybe he would have thrown the ball deep more. Maybe he would have had more volume. Maybe he would have connected more and had more passing stats. But they threw the ball to their running backs on 24% of their plays, which was the eighth highest rate in the entire NFL last year. If you look back to the previous years, they threw to the running back 17% of their plays 2018, 18% 2017, 17%, 2016. So they were at 17, 18, 17, and all of a sudden, no weapons on the outside, jumps up to 24%. It's not a surprise that his yardage overall dipped a little bit. So I'm not I'm not proposing that Aaron Rodgers is going to be back to his elite self this year, but if they can draft, I, I would be shocked if they don't go with a legit field stretcher or a legit wide receiver in the draft this year because it's such a deep class at wide receiver and, and there's so many talented prospects. If they don't use one of their first two picks on a wide receiver, I would be absolutely shocked. And I think that would be all the difference for a guy like Aaron Rodgers who needs that depth behind Devontae Adams. So not elite, but getting back to, you know, maybe the top 10, top eight, top six guys even, I, I don't think that's crazy of a stretch for Aaron Rodgers. As a fantasy quarterback, I'd be on board for that. All right, a couple other quick notes with quarterbacks. I do ask that if you are enjoying the video so far, thumbs up would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Just scroll down and it takes you two seconds to do so. If you are listening via podcast on iTunes, a rating and review would be mwah, gorgeous. It'd be wonderful. I don't care if you give us one stars, five stars. Any press is good press, except if you're Antonio Brown, then it's probably not good. AB aside, I would really appreciate a rating, review, comment, thumbs up, anything you could do to engage with your mans. All right, a couple other notes for the quarterback position. Drew Locke. He only played in five games. He was only their, their guy for five games, but he actually busted at a higher rate than Dwayne Haskins did. Locke busted in 80%. Four of those five games, he busted. Haskins busted in 67%. Both very high rates, horrible rates for no matter who it is. So I'm not proposing that Haskins was actually good, but he was less bad than Drew Locke was in terms of a consistency basis. Haskins did have zero booming games, zero games where he faded the public, where Drew Locke, Drew Locke did have his booming game. And I think people are excited about Drew Locke. You know, you saw the toughness. You saw he's kind of relatable. He's like rapping on the sidelines and shit, but don't let that deter you from the fact that he was terrible in fantasy. He had one big game, and again, I talk about the spectrum side of things. When players, you know, one, you don't have the, you don't have a big sample size. I said he played in five games, so you see that one big game, and you're kind of latching onto that. You're like, oh, he has a ceiling. Oh, that's like his potential. He could do that week in and week out, but for the most part, he was not that guy. They'll remember that 300-yard, three-touchdown game against Houston, who was a terrible fucking secondary, and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, Locke was good, or at least he showed glimpses of being good, And he, but he had no consistency to his game. So the takeaway for that is just that, especially with these younger quarterbacks, man, on a small sample size like this, make sure you're not fooled by one or two big games. Look deeper into the numbers, into the longevity. So sorry, Animal, but Drew Locke still sucks. Daniel Jones. Does he suck? I don't know. He's an interesting case, though. There was no in-between for him. He busted in six of 12 games but he faded the public in four games. Scored over 28 fantasy points in four of those 12 games. Busted in six of them. So 10 of the 12 games he played in, he was either fucking amazing or he was terrible. His big games predictably came against very weak opponents. It was Tampa Bay, it was Detroit, it was the Jets, it was the Redskins. So uh, take with that what you want. You know, the turnovers are obviously a very big contributor here. 12 interceptions in 12 games along with six fumbles. So if he can clean that up, I mean, there's not much not to like about, about Danny Dimes from a fantasy standpoint. It's really hard to care about a fantasy quarterback or, you know, to dislike a fantasy quarterback when they're not a great thrower if they have the supporting cast that 
Danny Dimes has around him with all the weapons and an improving offensive line and the rushing floor. He averaged 22.8 rushing yards per game last year. So, I mean, even if he is turning the ball over, even as he is a, not a good, you know, precise passer, which I don't know if he ever will be, I think as he progresses as an NFL quarterback, the floor will start to creep up a bit. That is my section on the quarterbacks. Let's dive into tight ends. When I started first looking at the consistency charts for the tight ends, I was like, this can't be right. There's no way this can be right. And I was pertaining to one particular number. Fade the public. The consistency charts, 24 points or more, considers fading the public. That's for running backs, wide receivers, and tight end. Quarterbacks is 28 points for these three skill players positions, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, 24 points or more. So I look back last year, individual games in which a player went over 24 fantasy points, half PPR. The, these consistency charts, I apologize, are all half PPR. I should have probably prefaced with that. If you went over 24 fantasy points, you faded the public. There was 66 instances last year in which a running back did that. There was 52 in which a wide receiver did that. Tight ends, there was four. That was it. It was Hunter Henry, Darren Waller, Mark Andrews, Zach Ertz. Each hit that mark one time. The year prior to that, there were 12. There was 300% more instances in which a tight end faded the public and went over 24 fantasy points though I don't want to skew it just on these small sample sizes so I did look back in 2017 there were only three so it was actually fewer than we had this year 2016 it was eight so it seems like it's kind of fluctuating I would say overall just given the averages of these years four is definitely on the low side so I think overall if you're looking at it from a macro standpoint the tight end position as a whole is probably in a bit of a buy window when it when we're going into 2020 especially talking from a redraft standpoint everyone will kind of think back to this year and think of a lot of low ceiling plays right you didn't have like not Kelsey and Kittle both did not have a game over 24 fantasy points you have just four instances so you're thinking about a lot of these mid-range guys who are probably going to be values in the sixth seventh eighth round and they're dropping that far because most of the analysis this summer is probably going to be like ah they don't really have the ceiling and a lot of it had to do with the fact that the touchdown totals for these tight ends were really down compared to a lot of the previous years you look at the top five fantasy tight ends this year Kelsey five touchdowns Kittle five touchdowns Darren Waller three touchdowns Zach Ertz six touchdowns Mark Andrews was the only guy that had a big number he had 10 touchdowns he was the only guy within the top five that had a big number and I look at that as a good thing from the tight end position to be honest because if these guys are putting up you know elite numbers big numbers without scoring touchdowns they're gonna have huge years when they do finally hit that seven eight nine ten touchdown mark while getting the yardage and the targets and the receptions a lot of the times you know the the top five are, are riddled with guys that don't get the yardage don't get the receptions but they just had these ridiculous spikes and touchdowns right you have the eric ebron's last year with like 14 touchdowns he usually has one guy like the jimmy graham who'll score double digit touchdowns on like fucking 32 catches and negative 42 yards those guys have absolutely no business being in the top five outside of these lucky touchdown numbers and you could already you already know next year they're not going to come close to those numbers so you don't have to draft them as top five guys I mean you could you could argue that like Andrews was that guy this year but does anyone think that Andrews is not going to be like a top five option at tight end next year no of course not and we're going to dive into him in a minute but I like the fact that the fantasy tight end landscape got away from those you know older guys who are relying on tight ends we have some legit athletic ballers seam stretchers coming onto the scene and it took a while for that old generation of guys you know the Greg Olsons who just signed with Seattle I don't know what the fuck's going on there and those older guys you know to finally fade out we have this new up-and-coming generation of tight ends that we've been waiting for you know the Mark Andrews is the Austin Hoopers the Hunter Henry's Tyler Higby's and Mike Gusecki's and, and guys like that right for the next like five years or so these are going to be the guys who are competing with the Kelsey Urches and stuff to to take the throne so while we're talking about Travis Kelsey you know we'll dive into the numbers the guy's been the fucking tight end one in fantasy for four straight seasons he did it with 205 fantasy points this year which was actually nearly 40 points behind what he did last year which is a big step back but it's only because last year was just a monstrous monstrous record setting season for Kelsey Kittle Ertz if he had the 205 fantasy points that he had this year he actually would have been behind Kittle and Ertz last year but he didn't so it doesn't matter Kelsey not only finished atop the tight ends in, in fantasy points but he was also providing you consistently with the best floor among all tight ends he only busted in one of 16 games six percent George Kittle was the next closest guy at 21 percent so Kelsey busted in six percent of his games the next best tight end Kittle who busted in 21 percent of the games while maybe this year particularly he did not give you the ceiling that you would expect from a Travis Kelsey he gave you the floor that you need from a Travis Kelsey if you were you know investing a first or second round pick into him which you had to basically this year and again Kelsey did not fade the public in any of his games although he did do it once in the playoffs so the capability is obviously there he did lead tight ends with four booming games it's really an impressive feat for him to finish as a tight end one 
despite only having five touchdowns this year, as I mentioned. I think that will absolutely bump back up next year because Mahomes was injured this year. He missed whatever it was, four or five games. And I think when we get a healthy Mahomes for 16 games, he's a lock to go for 35 touchdowns through the air. And Kelsey's going to score you know even if he scores seven touchdowns next year eight touchdowns that's a huge boost up in fantasy points that's an extra point an extra two points per game in the tight end landscape which is massive now let's talk about mark andrews because i'm I'm not gonna say i'm having trouble deciphering his season but it's really 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 interesting right he was at at first during the summer he was one of like the easiest breakouts to see coming i was kind of all over him but i immediately shied away and this was a mistake for me because i was watching the preseason games and that's when you get a lot of good usage numbers you're like ah they're only going to use that's when the coaches show you when they run their first team offense out in the preseason you're seeing what their packages are and you're seeing the basic personnel usage of those starting guys you say like no preseason uses but literally what we saw from Andrews was that he was still playing on 35 to 40 percent of the snaps and you could be like oh that's useless because he balled out but he only played on 43 percent of the snaps in the regular season so if you had told me right he's a full, he's a stud athletic beast catches the pass it like he, he does everything that you'd want from an elite fantasy tight end but if you had told me in the beginning of the year that one the Ravens would be dead last in terms of pan, pass attempts per game they were running at the highest single rate in the NFL and Andrews would only be playing on 43 percent of the snaps the entirety of the year there's no way you can predict him to be a top five fantasy tight end I mean you look at the other guys in the top five that finished Kelsey Kittle Waller Andrews Ertz if you look at team pass attempts and just snap share so just like play time and overall passing volume on the offense Andrews is the only guy who is a red flag on both sides of that right like some of them you know George Kittle and the Niners didn't pass the ball that often but he still played on 82 percent of the snaps the other guys were up at 90 percent of their snaps and that's why they finished in the top five so what Andrews did finishing as the tight end four in fantasy this year thanks obviously to the 10 touchdowns that he scored is ridiculously impressive so he did see a pullback in in overall playing time he didn't finish that low in terms of volume in terms of the other elite options yes he might have had like 30 40 less targets but his volume wasn't actually that low relative to the entire position right he was top five in targets with 98 fifth in overall yards seventh in receptions crazy because again he only ran on 43 percent of the snaps so when he was on the field Lamar Jackson loves him and that's the thing that you have to love about Andrews going forward you could skew the numbers any way you want talk about volume talk about efficiency but you just watch the game and Andrews is his go-to target week in week out play in play out if Andrews is on the field Lamar Jackson is looking his way first second third fourth fifth sixth says more about what Mark Andrews's fantasy prospects are when you look at the efficiency numbers first in hog rate this is a metric that's used on player profiler 24.3 percent which he is the targets per snap so if he was on the field if he took a snap he was getting targeted on 24 percent of his over 24 percent of his plays which is an incredible number because that's just a snap what if he's blocking that should pull the percentage down even more his 24.1 percent target share overall right the 24 percent of the targets overall on the team going to him as a tight end is elite like you rarely rarely ever see tight ends around that number wide receiver ones are usually around the you know the 25 to 30 percent the elite ones hit that higher mark but that's wide receivers you're expecting them to get the majority of their passing work in a given offense tight ends to be around the 24 percent mark is crazy his average depth of target first among all tight ends in the nfl so when he was on the field he was commanding a ton of targets although he was not on the field that often only 43 percent of the snaps his targets were long ones long valuable ones in the red zone down the middle of the field stretching the seam so i'm very interested to see what they actually give lamar jackson in terms of weapons on the outside like if we have to watch another year in which Willie Sneed is the fucking wide receiver one for Lamar Jackson, I'm going to lose my shit. I can't imagine that they're going to go into next year with just Hollywood Brown and Willie Sneed on the outside. I love Hollywood Brown, but they need a, a, a legitimate second option on the outside, outside of just Hollywood Brown and then Mark Andrews running up the seam. They give him one more option, and it should be interesting to see how they maneuver Andrews around, but... The fact that we just saw him throw the ball to Andrews so often in the red zone, near the end zone, just down the field when they were in scoring position tells you that that's probably something that's going to be sticky year over year. So all in all, Andrews was absolutely stellar. He tied Kelsey with four games that were booming or above, another four in cooking. He did bust six times. That's obviously not great to see, but you have to assume that Andrews is going to get a giant boost in playtime come 2020 fantasy football uh if he could do that if he can come anywhere near the efficiency numbers that he had this year and get an increase even if he goes from 43 to like 65 percent which is still not anywhere near the top tight ends right they're all running over 80 90 percent of the snaps on a given team if he can get to 65 percent imagine how good he's going to be all of that offset efficiency will come back in terms of volume so he was incredible some guys that were fucking anti-incredible vance mcdonald 
who boy did we whiff on this man i knew he played with a backup quarterback you know same thing with juju whatever but vance busted in 12 of the 14 games he played in literally un unusable he did not go over 40 receiving yards in a single game in 2019 that is the m most major fucking yikes I've, I've seen on the consistency charts as i was looking through them i mean he was set up to succeed coming into this year ab gone jesse james gone his upper percentile athleticism but Jesus fucking Christ. Who knows what happens if Big Ben is a quarterback for the entire year, but I feel like it's probably time to let go. He's turning 30. My bad on that one, y'all. Jimmy Graham, if the definition of dead isn't just Jimmy Graham, then, then everyone is immortal as far as I'm concerned. The guy busted in 81% of his games this year. And he was playing with Aaron fucking Rodgers. I'm actually excited to see Jay Sternberger, the rookie that they drafted last year, hopefully get uh, some kind of playtime in, in 2020. Because he's an athletic kid, big, good down the seam, and can catch the ball. Not going to go nuts over him, but I think he's definitely someone to keep an eye on. And as expected for rookies, even the flashy ones had very high bust rates. Like Noah Fant busted in 75% of his games. So as nice as it was to see the ceiling, he was wildly inconsistent. Hawkinson, 75% of his games were bust. Dawson Knox, 73% of his games were bust. And of their total games, that weren't busts the majority of them came in the second half of the season that's just natural course for rookies so the point being here is yes we're not going to take we're not going to be like oh no offense inconsistent there's no way he can improve because obviously rookie seasons for tight ends are very 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 few and far between where they're actually putting up usable good numbers for fantasy the point here is that they get better as the season progresses they get better as their career progresses obviously so do don't ever draft rookie tight ends in redraft leagues don't ever draft them because what happens is they always get off to a very slow low start and eventually they're going to be dropped they'll be dropped by like week six seven or eight and as they start to progress and get more comfortable with the nfl speed and the position that's when you can pick them up because they're going to be dropped i.e no offense Dawson Knox. Hawkinson was, you know, a kid. we'll just throw out the fucking history books on Hawkinson for his rookie year. He'll be bike. He'll be bike, as will I, next Thursday when we do the running back and wide receiver consistency charts. I apologize for getting this video out a little bit later than uh, planned, but we are here nonetheless. We show, woo, woo. I got to get on a fucking call with the pod father right now, actually. As we proceed to give you what you need. We appreciate all of the engagement and uh, thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing fantasy all off season long into the season and for the rest of our lives and whatnot. Make sure you go check out the draft guide, bigdogdraftguide.com. The consistency charts are available for those who have already purchased. So I love y'all and I'll see you on tomorrow's Fade the Public.